Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope everybody had a great Christmas season. And I'm sure everybody got a couple of gifts out there, right? So now that we're starting a new year, I just want to reflect a little bit on some gifts that we've been given, maybe some gifts and talents, right? Um, a lot of us have gifts and talents that we don't use. So we'll just go over maybe a couple of ways that we can use our gifts and talents, right? So discovering our gifts, right? Before you can use your gifts, you need to know what they are. So many children of God have dormant spiritual gifts inside of them. They neglect their gifts, not using them, and not even knowing what they are. In 1 Timothy, it says, do not neglect the spiritual gifts that is in, that is in you. Dedicate your gifts to God. In Romans 6.13, it says, Give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Maybe some of you know what your spiritual gifts are already, but if you're not just using them for the Lord, you're using them for yourselves. You need to humble yourselves and dedicate them back to the Lord. Develop your gifts. Gifts are like muscles. The more that you use them, the bigger they get. Everybody knows that, right? You can and should strengthen, develop, and grow any gift that God has given you. You get better at using a gift by practice, studying, or learning from other people who have the same gift. And we have many examples of that here in, the, in our congregation. And the last one is to deploy your gifts or use them. Use them in our congregation. Use them in your community. You can get out on the field and start doing something. In Romans 12, 6, it says, we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, we should do it in according to the faith that we have. So we should just go out there and use our gifts and talents that our Heavenly Father has given us. Have a great morning.
in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear, loving Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts before you this morning, glad that we can be in your house, glad that you have shown us the way to come to your altar on a Sunday morning, glad that we could set aside our thoughts and plans and, and our concerns and lay them, at, lay them at your feet, that we know you are our God, you are the one who's created all things. You're the Lord of all the universe. But you are also our Heavenly Father. That you love us with a Father's love. That you care for us. That you guide us. That you touch us. You've given us free will. You've given us the ability to do what we want. But you've also stayed near us. How you want to do that, why you want to do that is a mystery to us. And yet we are thankful for it. We come into your house happy to worship together as brothers and sisters to lift our voice to you, to put you in the right place in our hearts, that we can always remember that you are the God of all things and the lover of our soul. That, dear Heavenly Father, we can come to hear your voice, to hear what you have to speak to us, to say to us, to reveal yourself to us, to guide us a little bit further, to help us on our pathway to change, that we can ultimately come to Holy Communion to have the strength to change to celebrate the fact that your son is our betrothed. Your son is the savior of our soul who wants to be with us for all time and eternity. That we can have the strength of his overcoming power to change, to be like him, to be the way, way you want us to be, to be true children of God. Heavenly Father, we unite our hearts with those who go before us, our apostles. We think of all those who couldn't be here but connect themselves. Please let them feel the love of the congregation but especially your love. Let us be able to have an hour in heaven. Please cover those things we've left undone and let us have a wonderful moment with you. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my dear brothers and sisters, this morning we have a Bible verse out of Matthew, the second chapter and the second verse, where it says, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. We have an acceptance hymn. Oh no, response hymn is the choir. Please be seated. <clears throat>
Thank you, choir. Good morning. I don't know if you know, but it's a holiday today. Today is Epiphany Sunday. If you're like me, I said, what? <laughs> but it's a holiday in the Christian church. Epiphany Sunday is a celebration of God's revelation to us in Jesus. We can say, well, that happened kind of twice. On his baptism, his baptismal day, the Lord said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That was a revelation from God. But it also happened in this story that we hear in Matthew 2, where the wise men, the magi, come and they hear this, that this is God's son. This is God on earth revealed to us. And today, it happened, this, this story speaks about the magi, these Gentiles, these not part of the Jewish religion. And we know the story. This couple verses later, the shepherds get the message. And there the Jews get the message. They get shown that Jesus has come. The, the Messiah has come. So the service, this, the, the message for this morning, is that Jesus has come. The Messiah of your soul has come. He's here. So now what? Is he your king? The, the, the theme for the year is serving and reigning with Christ. Today is our relationship with Christ. And there's only one way to look at this relationship. He's your king or he's not. It's a really simple message. And it's, it's kind of a stark thing to think about. Messiah... Messiah actually translates to anointed one. And you can read the Old Testament that the anointed one was the king. Remember that story of David? He's anointed with oil. He's promised to be the new king. So this is the term that the Jewish people use. The Messiah. We're waiting for the anointed one. We're waiting for the king. And you can read the story Paul sends a letter to Tim Timothy and says, we have such a high priest. We have such a one that's gone through it all. He's seen every situation. He's encountered all of these feelings. He knows us. He's worthy to be our king. It's not one that you follow. I don't know if it's a boss at work. They say, do this. You can do this. You've never done this. You don't know how hard it is. This project's going to take me at least twice as long as you've budgeted. Here we can say Christ, the king, knows us, knows the situations we're in, has feel, felt these things, and can help us. Say, okay, so he's worthy to be my king, but is he my king? I had a... Uh, a little concern referencing this Bible verse, but we'll talk about Luke 11. In Luke 11, this is a, a nice chapter to read. I won't assign you the whole chapter, don't worry. The, in Luke 11, the first few verses are the Lord's Prayer. It's a good chapter to read. This is when the Lord Jesus talks about how to pray. Then he goes on and talks about asking, seeking, knocking. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you shall find. Then he throws out a demon from one of the people there. And I don't know. I tend to avoid the stories about demons. I tend to, okay, that's not really how we talk about things anymore. It's not really what we say. Say, oh, that, that person had that disease and Jesus healed that. But it was how people talked back then. They had a demon. They had something we don't understand. We were talking in the car on the way here. That, that's not that long ago. We, th this happens still, and it has happened only 100 years ago. I was listening to a podcast. They talked about how um, the plague, the plague was actually caused by a flea. 
the flea lived on rats. Rats were everywhere. You can see it in Renaissance paintings all the time. In the corner of all these paintings, there's rats in the corner. Beautiful, awesome masterpieces. And there's a rat sitting on the table eating a piece of bread. So why did they draw that? Well, because rats were everywhere. Except people who had cats. Who had cats? Old single ladies had cats. Old single ladies have cats, don't get the plague. People who don't get the plague, obviously witches. Obviously witches. So this, this still persists to this day, you see it at Halloween, witches have cats. Why? Because they didn't get the plague. If they don't have the plague, they must be witches. So this happened. This is what happened back then. They talked about demons, so Jesus used it as an example. So he uses this in the 20, 21st to 26th verse. We'll just read a quick section of the 21st verse. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all that his armor, all that his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. It's like Jesus is saying, you think you're strong? Somebody's going to come along stronger than you. And this is the, the demon part. And he says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. If you're like me, you read that and say, I have no idea what you're saying. What, what are you trying to tell me? What is it that I don't get about that saying? It actually ends up being really simple. Really, really simple. But Jesus is painting a picture. He goes, brothers and sisters, something is going to possess you. Something is going to take your focus. Something is going to live in your house. Is it the strong man or is it the weak man? What are you letting in? Because he says it clearly. You think you're so strong. You have this armor. You have this sword. You have this stuff. And then a stronger man comes, and it's all taken from you. And then he says, and then you, you, you think your house is in order. You, you, you get rid of this demon. You get rid of this thing. And guess what? It comes back seven times worse. And Jesus is painting this picture. Who have you let in? Who guides your soul? Who is in your heart? Who is it that's with you? What motivates you? That's how we'd probably say it today. What motivates you? What is your guiding light? What is it that drives you? You might, you might sit in motivational speakers, messages. What drives you? Is it, is it a desire for wealth? Is it, is it a desire for stature? Is it a desire for your ego? What is it that drives you? Something's going to. Brothers and sisters, that's a message Jesus actually preaches. Something is going to take hold of you. And if you don't think so, you're just wrong. You're just naive. You just don't even, you haven't even made the choice because something's going to take hold of you. Something is going to drive you. But the question is, do we choose to have Christ be the one that drives us? This message uh, to the Magi, it's kind of nice. They're shown with a star. I don't know about you, but I don't see a ton of stars. I see a few at my house. It's out far enough to, to see a few stars. But they don't disrupt my day. They don't disrupt my night. I can totally ignore them. But if you follow it, you can keep an eye on it. It's always available. You can see it in the sky. This is the, the really awesome parallels the Lord provides throughout his scripture. He says, just look at it this way, and you'll see what I'm trying to teach you. The Lord provides a guiding light for us, a star to follow, to follow him, to follow his message, to follow what he's taught us. But it's not, he's not going to grab you by the hand and drag you. 
He's given you free will. It's this amazing, frustrating idea that the Lord's given us free will and wants us to do his will. Why did you just not give me free will then if you wanted me to do this? But we have this choice. We have this opportunity. Is the Lord your king? Is he the king of your life? Say, on Sundays, yeah. It's not too much of a struggle to come to church on Sundays. I kind of built it into my habit ritual. I come to service on Sundays. That's what I do. And I say please and thank you. I'm good. It's so much more than that, dear brothers and sisters. And sometimes we forget that. How much more the Lord being the king in our lives actually means. The Apostle Schnabel once talked about it. You're either running towards the Lord or you're running from him. I I don't want to be the C.S. Lewis guy, but again, he spoke about he's he's not safe, but he's good. You're you're either going to jump into his arms, and he is your king. He is the only one we can go to, or you don't. Does that make you feel about this small? It makes me feel about this small, and I'm holding the service. The thought that there is no middle ground, but that's where I'm living. I'm living in this middle ground where I'm pretty good on some days and not so good on other days, and I kind of feel some faith, and then, yeah, not so much. The Lord says, there's no middle ground. There's no, lukewarm, I'll spit you out. You're either with me or you're against me. That's it. If the choice is yours. And when we realize how frail and how weak and how little we are, we realize we need a whole lot of help. We realize that faith in and of itself is a gift. That it's not something we build and we, we, we've done on our own will and our own might and our own abilities. It's not something like, oh, you lost your faith? Well, you better get it together. It's a gift. It's the Lord's shining light in your life. You just need to focus on it. You just need to look at it. You need to follow it. What does that look like? If you follow, if you search that out, if you seek that in your life, we think of it like, I think of it like a young man who's got a fiance. If that young man doesn't feel like they can shout it from the rooftops that this is the one I love, Something's not quite right. It doesn't, it doesn't make me feel like this is really the relationship that's going to last, right? Now, maybe you're shy. Maybe you're not, the, not that kind of person. But it just has to come out, right? This, this idea that it's just, it's just part of me. Talk about following the star. If you follow the love, follow the love in your life, follow what he has called you to. It's not a coincidence. God says, God is love. Jesus is the lover of my soul. You want to find him? You want to follow the guiding light? Follow the love in your life. Follow the best way to love in every situation. Apostle Schnabel talked about this too. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what the right thing to do is, the fair thing to do. But the loving thing to do is something else. Follow the light. Follow the love in your life. Follow it to him. And then we had a whole year of being rich in Christ. And I, like, I love this message that we become rich in Christ. He's part of us. He's the king in our lives. Our whole life centers around him. We have this relationship with him. And we're rich. Rich in today's world means I've got a lot of cash to spend. I've got sup- I, can, I have something to work with. But wealth means something else. Wealth means without working, the money's making itself. I own some houses. The houses get more expensive. Uh, people are paying me rent. I'm not doing a thing, but it's coming in. 
That's wealth. It's continuing to make money without effort. Wealth in Christ is the ability to have peace and joy and assurity well up inside of us, and we don't really know where it's coming from. What is happening? Well, I haven't done anything for this, except kept the Lord in my sights, except kept him in my heart, except focused my life around him. And suddenly, I have peace, even in tumultuous times. I have a surety. I have joy. Again, the, the, scripture, the Holy Scriptures have this awesome way of highlighting these things. You understand the Magi were commissioned by King Herod to find the baby so that he could kill him. The Magi hear this message and come and find the baby Jesus. You think they're a little at risk? Yeah. They go and escape Herod and go a different way. They weren't magically protected from this thing. Mary and Joseph have the baby Jesus. You know what happens? They escape to Egypt. They have to, they have to go away to Egypt. And they live in Egypt for many years until that King Herod dies. I know you probably remember there's another King Herod that's a different one. This King Herod dies. And then they can come back and live in Nazareth. The, the problems in our lives, the difficulties in our lives aren't going to go away. But there's wealth. This ability to have peace and joy and hope can well up in us. Why? Because we have a relationship with him because he is our king, because we've put everything else aside. That is hard. If he is your king, then we run towards him. We do what he's asked. We drop everything else. He's in charge. He's the one that tells me what to do in every situation. That's the hard part. That's the part I feel this small and feel that's nah, not right. But my dear brothers and sisters, when we feel this, this feeling like, oh, that one's not coming to church anymore, that's terrible. They need to come back. We need to identify that that's because we want them back because they are our brothers and sisters, because we love them. We realize us coming to church is the result of us having that feeling, that love for him. And sometimes we are middle ground. We aren't quite there. And we come here to get that faith ignited again. We want that feeling to come back. And we say, I've lost it. I've, I've, I've lost the star. I, can't, I don't know where to follow. And we come into the circle of the congregation to feel it from each other, to, feel, to hear it over the altar, to understand Okay, now, now I remember, now I see. If I give it all to him, if I throw myself at him, it's scary. It's intense. The world's going to look at me like I'm funny, that I do these things, that I, I don't know, play Christian music with the, with the windows down, pray in public, Let your own ego fall apart, fall down. Lift someone else up in the corporate world, at school. Oh, that's so odd. That's so weird. That's so different. And we say, but he's my king. He's the one I follow. And when we don't, we realize we're, we're all in the same position. We're all sinners. We all lack this. But our Heavenly Father says, come. Come on. You are the one I love. You are the one I want. I want to be your king. I want to be in your life. And we have to remember, it's all or nothing. We have to really go all the way, all the way in our lives to say he is it in every piece. We can't say, okay, Sundays, Wednesdays, Saturdays, we're going to go serve the community. We're going to go do some... No, there's no heart that he's not supposed to fill. Brothers and sisters, if he's not filling your life, 
Something else is. Period, the end. If he is not filling your life, something else is. And this is what Jesus is saying. It's going to be worse. You're finding your salvation. You're finding your peace. You're finding these, this wealth in some other way. And it's not going to last. It's going to get bad. You're not going to know who to turn to. You're not going to know what to, what to do. The herods of your life are going to come. But if you put me in the center, if you have this relationship with me, if you establish me as your king in your life, I'm the one that can actually help. I'm the one who can actually save you. I'm the one who can actually bring peace and joy and contentment in all of these situations. There's no one else to turn to. And sometimes we have to like take off the glasses and, and realign and re reestablish that, yeah, you know, that is true. I try this like making a lot of money thing. And I try this exercising to feel healthy thing. And I try this and I try that. And I say, these are the things that are going to make me happy. These are the things that are going to make me feel fulfilled. If I do really well at work, I'm going to feel fulfilled, and I'm going to be joyful, and I'm going to be peaceful, and I'm going to have a hope because I have a good retirement, and all of these things. And the Lord says, ah, you can have all those things, but I'm going to give them to you. Put me first. Put me in the center. You say, yeah, but, oh, that's hard. Like, I, I need this, and I need that, and I have to do I have to do good at work, and I have to do well with my health, and I have to do this. How, how can I possibly give it all to you when I have to deal with these things? Why? You don't have any trust. Right? If the Lord says, the Lord God Almighty says, you put me first, I'll take care of you. you say, yeah, but I got to handle these things. I have to do these things. He says, put me, I'm the king of your life. I'm the king of all things. I'll take care of you. It's a hard thing to do, to trust, to believe him, to exhale, to let go, and say, okay, I'm going to follow the love. I want to follow the star. I'm going to do the things you ask of me. I'm going to put you first. I'm going to put that ego down. I'm going to let you guide me. But man, I got to trust. That's the hard part. Mary and Joseph had to trust. The Magi had to trust. These situations were coming. The Lord says, I have you. I have you in hand. I'll take care of you. And the beautiful part is, you're going to be joyful. You're going to be peaceful. You're going to feel love. Even in those situations, just do it this way. Because if you don't do it this way, something else is going to get in there. And it's going to be worse than when you started but I'm going to welcome you back. When you realize that you've done the wrong thing and you need to get those things out, come here. Come into the congregation. Be with your brothers and sisters. Because when you're down, they may be up. And then hear the word, because I'll help you realign you. I'm going to help you, because I love you. You're going to come, and you're going to have the strength of my son. That's why I sent him, because I know this is hard. This is impossible. Every day you got to give up your own ego. Every day you have to put trust in me. Every day you got to put me in the center of your life. So, guess what? I'm going to be with you every day. I'm going to be there to show you the way. Amen. Amen. So we have an acceptance hymn from the congregation, star to which I'm looking. The priest of Agatha can continue. We can stay.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. We just sang a very nice phrase, or two phrases I can say, right? Gold for which I'm striving, all, O Lord, art thou. And what did preschool ask us today? Is the Lord all, everything in our lives? Or is he not? You think back to your relationships, for those that may be married, you had that first love, you kind of talked about it with the, the fiance, right? No matter what was going on, you found the time to be with that person. You wanted to be with that person. For me, when I was dating my wife, I lived about 30 minutes east of her, and at that time there was a lot of district activities, you know, in the Bayside area in Queens, and so it was convenient enough that I had to pass her house so I had an excuse to pick her up for district choir, concert choir, youth guide, whatever it may have been. And even if those things didn't happen, and when things were out east, somehow I still found ways to go west to get back out east. And so that's in the natural. How about our relationship with our Heavenly Father? Do we look to spend that kind of time with him, if I can put it that way? There is... I won't, I won't embarrass the sister, but I'll say one of the two sisters that are playing this morning found our response hymn, and she was a little upset with me because um, they wanted to use it before the service. But when these words caught my eye, I couldn't help but think that this was the right thing. So obviously the Lord was speaking to us. And it was when the soloist was singing in the second verse there, it says, the world is ever near me. I see the sights that dazzle, the tempting sounds I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and within. But then, he says, but Jesus, draw thou near and shield my soul from sin. As preschool was talking, I don't know about you, but I feel like there's these things that are dazzling, right? That are, 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 are taking us maybe, or taking me, if I can put me, I don't wanna speak, speak for all of you, but there's things that grab our attention. And then what happens? We don't have time for the Lord. Are we looking to the Lord to grab, to make him the attention to put those other things out? When I think about the relationship, if you can put up that um, Bible verse from Romans in, in the eighth chapter there, um, Kevin, thank you. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the congregation, and there is no doubt about his relationship and his love for God. And if we can read this, it may be a little bit long, but just stick with it for a second. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, tr shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Apostle Paul used a lot of words there, which is why I said it's a little long, but... He is emphasizing how much he feels that love. Okay, ask yourself the question. This is 57 AD-ish that he writes this. Think back 10 years, because we're going to jump to a Bible verse from 10 years from now, from this one. How was my relationship with Christ, how is my willingness with Christ to serve him compared to how it is now? If I'm honest with myself, my dear brothers and sisters, I don't know if it's the same. There's a song that we sing that's not spiritual, I'll say, <laughs> but it's from a famous movie that you all know. You've lost that love and feeling. As you, I don't know what you said, but something made me think about that as, he, as the preschool was serving. And I said to myself, have I lost that love and feeling for the Lord? Can we put up the second Timothy uh, verse, Kevin? Thank you. So, this is Apostle Paul writing about 10 years later. He still has that love and feeling, and he, he tells us something here that's important to know. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, 
endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Anatok and Iconium and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So right there, we'll stop there for a minute before we go on, Kevin. Just to provide context there, I think it was Lystria was the, um, the hometown of Timothy. Apostle Paul was left there to be, was stoned and left there for dead. But he made it through, and he's still talking about this. Let's continue on to the 14th verse, um, Kevin. Thank you. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it. And how from the infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We were all taught things when we were younger which helped form our relationships. If we are doubting, my dear brothers and sisters, let us go back to what we have been taught and say, well, okay, my relationship with my Heavenly Father is not so good right now. Why is that? What were, we, what were we taught? Are we praying? Are we having fellowship with one another? Are we talking to each other? There are many in this congregation that have amazing experiences uh, that you can draw upon in your faith. Are we coming into the house of the Lord to be able to draw strength from the Holy Communion? All those things that you go back to Acts 2.42, right? That still applies, my dear brothers and sisters. The question is, are we actually still doing that in our relationship with our Heavenly Father? Amen. Amen. As Priest Levaglio served, I, I thought of how, how humbling it is to think about where we are. Have I lost that loving feeling comparing ourselves to Paul here? My friend was tapping on the, the Bible. Each, each of those words Paul pun punctuated. Nothing is going to keep his love from me. Do you think he had the trust needed to really put the Lord as king in his life? Because that's where it starts, right? You trust that he actually is king. He can do the things he needs to do in your life. You take a leap and you put him there. You have some faith to do it. And then these things happen. These things that reinforce your faith, reinforce your dedication to him. The way we see the world changes. The things still happen. Persecutions still happen. But what changes is us. Do you feel like you're there? You feel like you're too full of other things, too overflowing with concerns and worries, and these are the things I have to do, and my own ideas and my own plans. You can see there, I went from you to me. I couldn't help it. It's just, I feel this, this is there really a depth to accept the Lord? You say, I have this much space left in my life. You can fill that. The Apostle Schnabel on Christmas talked about the Lord being a gift. And we have to use that gift. And it made me think of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is a sea that has no outlet. And they call it, it's dead because it's dead. There is no outlet. If we don't use the gift, if we don't have an outlet, so my dear brothers and sisters, you feel like you're too full? You feel like I can't accept more? You feel like I can't take that trusting leap? The Lord says, empty yourself first. Go and do the things I've taught you. Go and just try. Be loving to your neighbor. Serve one another. Use the gift I've given you. And then it'll start to flow into you because I won't shove it in. I can't, I can't fill a cup already filled. I've given you free will for a reason. You have to keep using it. Why do we keep having services? It has to flow out of us so that we can be filled again.
it has to be a continual process. If we don't use it, we get filled up. If we don't use the gift, if we don't use him in our lives, he doesn't get any stronger in our hearts. Dear brothers and sisters, if we need to make a change, it starts with him. We have to come to him. Faith itself is a gift. We have to come to him. We say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what you're saying. That's okay. Just go and serve. Let's start there. Serve one another. Follow the love in your life. Then he'll start to fill you. How do we move from where we are? We are, we are repentant now. We are coming to Holy Communion. We want to be changed. And this whole service is like a laser beam focused light on my heart saying, you're not where you need to be. You are not head over heels. You are lukewarm at best. How do we make it from here to there? How do we go from a heart that I'm trying, Lord. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, Monday comes and I, all these things start happening. And I lose focus on you. And I lose this, this guiding light. He says, yeah, I know. First, let it flow through you. Let, let my love, let the gift that I am in your life flow. And then change can happen then you'll see it happen. Then you'll see that putting me here is the right thing. And then you'll have that trust. You'll have that confidence that Paul did. And you can say, nothing is going to stop him from helping me. Nothing is going to stop him from keeping me safe. Nothing is going to stop him from helping me feel that. That's when we come to Holy Communion, dear brothers and sisters. We say, I need that. I, need, I, I don't have that. I haven't had that, but I want it. They say, okay. Then get to work. Start serving. Start loving one another. Because I get that you don't trust me yet, but you're going to. I get that I'm not the king of your life yet, but it's going to become abundantly clear that this is the only place to turn to. I am the only place. But we have a path forward. Because if you don't choose him, something else is going to fill you. But dear brothers and sisters, we're here because we believe that we want to be filled by him. But we're not. We're not completely. This is why we come to Holy Communion. This is what all this preparation is for. To say to my, our, my Heavenly Father, I haven't made it, but I want to make it. I keep losing the ball. I keep dropping it. But I want to hold you in the center of my life. The choir can have a repentance hymn.
Let us rise and pray the Lord's Prayer together. And we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In the commission of my sender, the apostle, I proclaim unto you the glad tidings. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, your sins are forgiven, and the peace of the risen one abide with you. Amen. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we have heard your word. We give thanks that you have assured us of the forgiveness of our sins. And now we prepare to come before, before your altar to receive the Holy Communion, to receive the strength, to, to say, yes, you are my betrothed. You are the one I want to be with forever. You are my king. You are the king of my life. You are the king of all things. We can trust in you. We can trust that you love us. We can trust that you will care for us. You, we can trust that you will pour this love and joy and peace into our hearts and we'll barely have place to contain it. But we know we have fallen short and we give thanks that you can love us still. We give thanks that you give us grace to still receive your strength, to still be assured of your forgiveness, to still receive your love. Dear Holy Father, we come humbly knowing that we don't deserve it. Come humbly knowing that we aren't head over heels. We aren't to, to that point that we need to be, that we can truly give you more space, let you be the king of our entire life in all things. Dear Holy Father, please give us the strength to do so. Let us be changed into truly your children, those that give you all the space in their hearts. Be with us now. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now we shall celebrate Holy Communion. And now the Lord's table is prepared. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate bread and wine for Holy Communion and lay there upon the once brought, eternally valid sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the Lord took bread and wine, gave thanks, and said, This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant given for many for the remission of sins. Eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you proclaim the Lord's death Till he comes. Amen. Body and blood of Jesus given for you. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The Lord now invites you to come forward for Holy Communion.
Let us rise and close this service with a prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, once more we sit, give thanks. What else can we say but thank you for all that you've done for us, that you've shown us the way, that you reveal yourself to us. And it takes faith, but you've also gifted that to us as well. That when we struggle and we stumble and we fall, you can lift us up. You can show us the star in our life that we can also follow you. We can feel the love poured into our hearts. We just need to use it. Dear Heavenly Father, please let us, let us be changed. Let us be, be able to move ahead. Let us be able to have, be uplifted and strengthened and have new strength to do your will, to do the things you've called us to do, to love like you have loved, to care like you have cared. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings into your house. Please bless them. Let us serve to strengthen your work. We think of those who connect themselves to us. We think of those who pray and, and, and draw close to you. Please let them feel your love. Let them feel the prayers of the congregation. Please bless those who are not feeling well, who have illnesses, who are struggling. Heavenly Father, let them feel your hand of blessing. Let them feel that peace and that joy that wells up. And we can't even point to where, but dearly Father, let it come out. Let the congregation be able to surround each other. Let us be able to be truly brothers and sisters that we can truly turn to each other for everything, comfort and love and assurity and strength that we can truly be able to pull together as a congregation and love each other. Above all things, dear Heavenly Father, please send your Son. We long to go home. Please make us worthy. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. So you may be seated. We have a choir and congregational hymn to end. Uh, I think some announcements and a video. Hello, hello, yes. So our closing hymn, we're all going to engage in a relationship with our Heavenly Father with a song called, I Will Call Upon the Lord. We've done this a couple times. The choir is going to say, to call something out, and we are going to repeat, and then we get into the chorus together. It's gonna to be a lot of fun, so keep an eye out on the board there, thank you.
have a um, special announcement this morning. We'd like to welcome Deacon John Ricks, his family, and his mom, Ellie Ricks, to uh, the Woodbury Congregation. Next Sunday, we will have a special closing hymn, and in preparation for that, our children are invited to join in, and there will be a rehearsal after service in the RI room for the children. And also this morning after service, we will be taking down the Christmas decorations. If you can stay a bit to help, um, we especially need help with the wreaths, the tree, Cindy Schultz will be organizing that, so you can see her and um, lend your hands. And the minister call with Apostle Fent that was originally scheduled for January 12th is now going to be um, on January 17th at 8 p.m. And we would like to inform you of the passing of Henry Charles Bumbach, brother to our sister Johanna Schoen. Uh, he passed on Saturday, December 31st, 2022. Henry was a member of the Uniondale Congregation for decades before moving to the Schenectady area. Arrangements for a local memorial service are underway and details will be shared when they are available. Please remember the family during this time. And we have bagels and coffee to give you some sustenance before you help take down decorations. <laughs> and have a very blessed day. Dear brothers and sisters, a new year is a gift. No matter what the coming months hold in store for us, we can be sure God is still at work. He will continue to work on drawing us to himself through his love, to lead us into his fellowship, into internal glory. A central component of his plan of redemption is the kingdom of peace. This is when the participants in the first resurrection shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is what we read in Revelation 26. We want to be together with Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, a new year is a gift. No matter what the coming months hold in store for us, we can be sure God is still at work. He will continue to work on drawing us to himself through his love, to lead us into his fellowship, into internal glory. A central component of his plan of redemption is the kingdom of peace. This is when the participants in the first resurrection shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is what we read in Revelation 26. We want to be together with Christ as soon as possible and work alongside him. We are preparing ourselves for this already today. And that's why our annual motto for 2023 is serving and reigning with Christ. To understand the motto correctly, let us take a closer look at the kingdom of peace. Serving. This is the actual purpose for the priests of God and of Christ. Their service consists of worshipping, praising and glorifying God, but also of preaching the gospel and leading people to God. With Christ, we are not only to serve alongside him, but to work on his behalf. Today, we are still trying to become more and more like Jesus. But his priests in the kingdom of peace will be so permeated with his essence that they will literally embody his love and mercy. They will also be endowed with the authority of Christ. For this reason, nothing and no one can prevent them from accomplishing their mission. Reigning. This has nothing to do with worldly rule. The point is to embody the love of Christ with every fiber of our being. 
those who succeed in this endeavor will help the love of Jesus to prevail. And they make the kingdom of God visible, just as Jesus did. His rule has nothing to do with compulsion or pressure, but is solely defined by the drawing power of love. Ruling without exercising power, we are back to serving. Serving and reigning with Christ. We not only want to begin with this in the kingdom of peace, but already do so today. And that's why this task is on our training program for 2023. Serving, how can we do this today? On the one hand, by leaving our day-to-day -day lives behind to come to church. This is where we worship God and praise and glorify Him in the fellowship of believers. On the other hand, we do so by putting the gospel of Christ into practice in our daily lives. Our service to others is to love them as Jesus loves them. We have also been called to rule today. This does not mean that we try to somehow exercise power over our neighbor. Certainly not. Rather, the point is to rule over our own thoughts and actions. We can master this with Christ, with his help, and by following his example. Here are some examples. His love does not divide, but unites. His grace picks us up when we fall. His wisdom helps us to learn from our mistakes. The best way to remain in control of our own destiny is to let Christ reign in our hearts. May this idea guide us, particularly throughout this year. These are just some initial thoughts on our annual motto. But the year is still young. And if the Lord does not come first, we will still have the opportunity to experience many more divine services. I look forward to discovering the additional aspects that the Holy Spirit will reveal to us. Together with all the apostles, I wish you, dear brothers and sisters, a blessed and fulfilling year 2023.